we've been moving sideways for a long time in an extremely weak housing market. I think a fair assessment is to say the housing market is still weak, and uh, this this uh, settlement is really not going to have any, I think, noticeable effect on the overall housing market. This is at Brookings, a weekly in-depth look at issues behind the news. This week, the housing market and help for distressed homeowners. Millions of Americans have been affected by the housing market crisis. While some have lost equity, others have lost their homes. A plan allocating $25 billion to help some of these homeowners is in the works. And now, more than five years after the bubble burst, how healthy is the housing market? Senior fellow Ted Geyer takes a closer look. So with this settlement, Ted, who wins, who loses? Upside for the banks is that uh, they are resolving some of the uncertainty that they were facing with regards to this litigation. So that kind of frees them up to kind of return to normal practices and at least get some of this litigation risk. And for the most part, I think they saw this coming. So they've already written down a lot of these costs. And so it's not going to be a huge hit, hit to those banks, I think. Another kind of winner or loser, maybe on the loser side, or at least there's a lot of uncertainty, is on the investors. So again, these banks, for the most part, they service loans that are part of mortgage-backed securities owned by others, owned by investors. And I think investors are a little bit worried that one of the ways that the banks are going to comply with this are going to be to write down principal on loans that the banks don't own that instead the investors own. So that, of course, opens up a risk of litigation from the investors to the servicer. It's unclear how they kind of maneuver that. But I think there is some jitters among investors out there. Uh, that 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 the the services responsibilities to them to make sure that they service these loans in a fiduciary responsible way may be undermined, and so that I think makes investors a little bit uh, uncomfortable. And then the last, I guess, is from the taxpayer point of view. A lot of programs we've seen over the last few years have been taxpayer financed. This is not directly taxpayer financed, so in some sense, the taxpayer doesn't lose. And in fact, there is a little bit of money for state and federal governments from these. Uh, whether or not it's for FHA or for state programs. So in that sense, I guess the taxpayers win a little bit. All right, so you don't think it's going to have a major impact, but is it a smart move for right now? That's a tough question to, to answer. I think uh, once this litigation risk presented and you had all these states involved and all these uh, uh, potential borrowers who, who, who were involved, and I should say it's still unclear how many people were foreclosed upon who shouldn't have been foreclosed upon. That's kind of been lost in all this. It just was identified that they have done some practices they, they shouldn't have done in the servicing, and that presented this, this kind of litig uh, litigation response. Uh, so I, you know, I don't know. You know, once that's out there, resolving it, I think, is a good thing, and I think it was even good for the banks to resolve it. But as far as is this good policy? You know, the refinance program, uh, it depends what it's replacing. You know, the president announced a refinance program in the State of the Union, again, for, for loans that aren't Freddie and Fannie loans, because there's a separate program for those, except his plan would have taken those, those loans and put them on the government's uh, balance sheet, which I think is, is risky. So in some sense, this is an alternative. It's saying $3 billion to refinance these loans by these private banks so that the taxpayer doesn't have to take the credit risk from those new refinanced loans that are high-risk loans when they're underwater. So in some sense, that is, that is an improvement over that other policy. Foreclosures are an important tool for measuring how healthy the housing market is. Are they on the rise? Are they likely to increase in the near future? In the short term, we might see a little pickup in foreclosures. I mean, I think there are about 2 million homes in the foreclosure process, and those have been knotted up for quite a while. It's, it's a very protracted uh, uh, process. In some states, it takes hundreds of hundreds of days uh, before someone actually is foreclosed upon through that process. And so you might get, as a result of this settlement, uh, if anything, you might get a slight increase in getting clearing out that foreclosure inventory. Uh, what you've had is you've had these banks that have been facing this litigation risk. We've known this now for a few years. They've been involved in the settlement, and it's been a risk that there hasn't been resolved. And now uh, one of the things they're getting out of this package is at least for one portion of their litigation risk, it's going to be resolved. They might be exposed to other risks. And so that might be able to, if anything, free them up to actually move some of these homes through the foreclosure process a little bit quicker. So you might actually see a slight pickup. Well, Ted, what options are out there for someone who's having a hard time in this housing market? If you are underwater uh, and you have taken a hit to your income, um, let's say you've lost your job or you've, or you've, lost, uh, or you've had a decrease in your wages, there's a, li a very limited set of possibilities for you as far as staying in your home. 
There are government programs out there, some of which are, are designed to try and lower your interest rate. But even those are very hard to qualify for if you have no income, if you have very low income, because uh, the whole idea of that program is to reduce your your interest rate to an affordable level. But if you're really not, if you took, if you lost your job at an affordable level, especially if you if you have a house that you can't afford, it's really hard to it's really hard to to achieve that. Uh, so, and then there are other programs out there to try and incentivize short sales, so that okay, your house is worth more than uh, less than what you owe, and you can't afford the mortgage payment. Let's try and get you a buyer for your house real quickly, and have the bank basically call it even, even though you're not going to pay off the full loan. What's it really going to take to restore some health and vitality into the housing market? I don't know that there's any one policy that's going to really fix where we are in the housing market, and we've been here for a number of years now. It's really a commentary on the scope of the housing bust that we've seen. When you, when you have the poor underwriting conditions that we had leading up to this, the very little uh, equity that people were putting as down payments when they were purchasing their homes, the risky loans that people were getting, and then you couple that with a, a, a over 30% drop in housing values, that is quite a hole to come out of. And so we've been through going, trying to dig out now for a number of years. And you see, we had we essentially built way too many homes than we needed, and you couple that with a recession where people are, are retrenching, they're kind of doubling up, you know, teenagers and young adults are living with their parents, and so there's not as much demand out there. So you have both way too much supply and not a lot of demand, and that leads to just a severe glut of housing. And unfortunately, it's, a, it's, it's just a matter of time before you work through that. We've had all these other complications where we have a foreclosure process that doesn't work very well, and these are long, protracted uh, episodes that just take a long, long time to clear a market, and all the while we have this kind of overhang of, of homes that are underwater that may not be in the foreclosure process, but they may be headed there, and all this puts downward pressure on housing prices and makes for a weak market. Have we arrived at a teaching moment? The real lesson learned here is we now realize that working up to the, to the to bursting of the bubble in mid-2006 and 2007, we certainly can point fingers at really poor underwriting, uh, uh, very little money down. This is, and this was both encouraged by the government sector and the private sector. So there's lots of, lots of blame to go around. Some recent data suggests that we have, have have at least hit bottom, and that if you look at things like housing construction and and some optimism measures for home builders, there is a slight pickup. Now this is a slight pickup from really rock bottom levels. But nonetheless, it is a pickup, and it does suggest that we may finally be turning a corner, albeit it's still a very weak market. Stay up to date with the latest research, learn about Brookings events, and search our directory of experts, all from your mobile device. To download Brookings for your BlackBerry, Android, iPhone, or iPad, go to brookings.edu mobile.